Welcome. My name is Joe White. I'm Professor of Political Science, Luxembourg Family Professor of Public Policy, and Director of the Center for Policy Studies at Case Western Reserve University. It is my pleasure to welcome you uh, here and whoever watches this on, uh, on video to this uh, Wiskin uh, lecture, Wiskin Global Comments lecture on uh, wealth, health, and democracy in uh, East Asia and Latin America. Was it Latin American? Yeah, East Asia and Latin America uh, by Professor Jim McGuire of the Department of Government at uh, Wesleyan University. Um, I, my own work is mostly on healthcare in uh, the uh, quote unquote developed or first world. And so um, I would not claim to be an expert at all on the developing global south, whatever you call it. Um, but when I encountered uh, Jim's book, I was really quite struck by the way that it both addresses major, major themes in the comparative health policy literature uh, at any level of, de of development, namely the effects of political structure, of political representation, and of wealth, and at the great sophistication and care with which the research w has been done. Uh, it is really a stellar piece of work, uh, which is one reason why it won the uh, Stein Rocken Prize for Comparative Social Science Research. Uh, Professor McGuire uh, comes to this field after um, originally specializing in particular on Latin American politics and uh, on uh, the politics of Argentina, including a well-known book on Peronism without Peron. Um, and so uh, I guess to some extent uh, he's, he's, he's always been focused on what it is that governments do and why, and what is it that, it, that, that it's, you know, how do you think about the performance of governments in a very wide-ranging way. And that probably has something to do with uh, how he has come to write this, this really quite superb book and as part of really quite superb research on one of the main themes actually in, I think, the study of international health, the study of international development, the study of, of international politics. And with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Jim McGuire. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for that kind introduction and also for inviting me here to Case Western. Um, I also want to thank the Center for Policy Studies for making the Briskin Global Currents Lecture possible. Uh, so as Joe mentioned, this talk is going to summarize a book I wrote a few years ago on basically why some developing countries do better than others at reducing premature mortality. And wealth, health, and democracy uses a mixed methods or nested analysis research design in which case studies and qualitative historical comparisons are sort of nested within a quantitative analysis. So the book begins in chapter two with a multiple regression analysis of political, policy, and socioeconomic factors associated with lower infant mortality across about well, across uh, 105 developing countries in 1990. The analysis addresses both public health and political science questions. On the public health side, it explores the conjectures that more public spending on health care should lead to more widespread, more widespread trained attendance at birth and more widespread child immunization and that better maternal and child health services, along with other social services, should lead to lower infant mortality. On the political science side, it evaluates the proposition that more democracy will lead to greater public spending on health care, more widespread utilization of basic health care, education, water and sanitation, and family planning services, and to lower infant mortality. The book then moves on in chapters three to 10 to historical case studies of the determinants of the pattern and pace of infant mortality decline from 1960 to 2005 
in eight societies, four in Latin America and four in East Asia. And it ends up in chapter 11 with quantitative and historical comparisons that help to illuminate how much and in what ways democracy promoted primary health care programs and how much and in what ways primary health care programs reduced infant mortality. A general finding of the book on the public health side is that there are two ways for a society to achieve a rapid decline of premature mortality. One is to produce extremely fast economic growth and extremely low levels of income inequality. This is the South Korea and Taiwan route. Nice work if you can get it. The second way is to provide inexpensive basic health care services, even in a context of slow economic growth and high income inequality. This is the Chile and Costa Rica route, and it's puzzling to me that more countries don't do this. On the political science side, the main finding is that democratic experience, which Chile and Costa Rica have more of than most developing countries, contributed significantly to the emergence and efficacy of nationwide primary health care programs, indeed, in a wider range of ways than is often recognized. Basic health care services are not the only types of social provisioning that can help to reduce infant mortality. Education, family planning, safe water, and sanitation, as well as social assistance programs, are also important. Democracy, moreover, is not the only factor that encourages the provision of basic social services to disadvantaged people. Political le leadership, international factors of various sorts, and the activities of civil society organizations also matter. I recognize the importance of these other factors, but in the book I treat them in a way analogous to how one might treat control variables in a multivariate statistical analysis, in other words, as factors whose omission could bias conclusions about the impact of the variables of interest. So as far as the quantitative analysis goes, uh, the um, diagram on the screen depicts a model of the causal relations that I am proposing mediate the association between democracy and infant survival. Controlling for the socioeconomic factors at the bottom there, I use multiple regression to test three public health hypotheses and three political science hypotheses. The public health hypotheses are that first, PH1, <laughs> More public health care spending will be associated with more widespread utilization of maternal and infant health care services. The second public health hypothesis is that the more widespread utilization of maternal and infant health care services and other basic services will be associated with lower infant mortality. And the third is that higher public health care spending will be associated with directly lower infant mortality as well. The political science hypotheses are that more democratic experience will be associated with higher public health care spending, more widespread utilization of basic social services, including maternal and infant health care services, and also with uh, lower infant mortality. The data were taken from the 104 developing countries with populations uh, greater than half a million in 1990, plus Taiwan. Most observations were as close to 1990 as the data permitted, and the analysis was cross-sectional rather than time series cross-sectional, although I did measure democracy using something called the Polity 4 Democracy Index in two different ways, 
Alternatively, as long-term democratic experience, which was uh, the average annual democracy score in the 91 years from 1900 to 1990 inclusive. Uh, and the second way I measured democracy was as short-term democratic practice, which took the same variable and took the annual observations only over the 11 years from 1980 to 1990. In each of the six analyses, I held constant seven socioeconomic control variables. One was uh, gross domestic product per capita, affectionately known as GDP per capita. The others were income inequality, as measured by the Gini index, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, dominant religion, fertility, population density, and urbanization. And in some of the checks for robustness, I also held constant uh, three different uh, geographical factors, tropical location, um, proportion of the land area with ready access to uh, seas or rivers, and remoteness from three major centers of, uh, of world trade. I think that was Tokyo, New York, and London. At the same time as I was trying to control for these socioeconomic variables, however, I find them to be of interest in themselves. Uh, I find them to be of interest as a test of what is sometimes called the wealthier is healthier conjecture, which holds that GDP per capita and other socioeconomic factors explain the lion's share of variation in infant mortality levels and changes. The wealthier is healthier hypothesis actually found some support in my study. GDP per capita alone explained 70% of the cross-national variance in infant mortality across the 105 countries. GDP per capita plus income inequality together explained 72%. And GDP per capita plus all of the other six socioeconomic variables I mentioned together explain 85% of the infant mortality variance across the 105 countries. Nonetheless, the provision of maternal and infant health care services lowered infant mortality significantly even after these socioeconomic factors were taken into account. To weigh the relative impact of these factors, the socioeconomic factors on the one hand and the sort of uh, maternal and infant healthcare factors on the other. Uh, across the 105 cases uh, in 1990, I used a statistical simulation package for the Stata uh, statistical software called Clarify. And the Clarify routine allows you to set all of the control variables to their observed means and then estimate how much a one standard deviation change uh, in um, the, uh, you know, in GDP per capita or uh, the Gini index or mean years of female schooling or trained attendance at birth would be likely to affect the infant mortality rate. It cranks out a point estimate and uh, a standard error level of precision. Well, the answer was a one standard deviation rise in GDP per capita would reduce infant mortality by about 20 per thousand. A one standard deviation drop in the Gini index would reduce infant mortality by about five per thousand. A one standard deviation rise in mean years of female schooling would reduce infant mortality by about 10 per thousand and a one standard deviation rise in trained attendance at birth would also reduce the infant mortality rate by about 10 per thousand. In other words, the statistical impact on the infant mortality rate of a one standard deviation rise in GDP per capita uh, was, by this measure, about twice as large as that of an uh, analogous rise in trained attendance at birth or female schooling. 
That result might seem initially to vindicate uh, a narrow version of the wealthier is healthier conjecture. It's true, the results do show that it is more desirable to achieve, if you're a country, a one standard deviation rise in GDP per capita than it is to achieve a one standard deviation rise in trained attendance at birth or in mean years of female schooling. Those results, however, don't tell us much about the feasibility of attaining such a rise. In fact, experience seemed to suggest that it is much harder to achieve the requisite changes in GDP per capita and income inequality than it is to achieve the requisite changes in trained attendance at birth or female schooling. Using Clarify, I estimated how much of a change in each of those four variables would be required to reduce the infant mortality rate from 54 to 49 per thousand. Why did I choose 54 per thousand as the starting infant mortality rate, you might ask? If you did ask, you would be sorry because the answer is that it's the mean of the exponentials of the natural logs of the 105 1990 infant mortality rates. We can come back to that later if there are any masochists in the audience. Uh, so what I found that uh, is that for a country starting out around the sample mean of each independent variable, it would take getting that 5% reduction in infant mortality from 54 to 49 per thousand, a rise in GDP per capita of about $391, a decline in the Gini index of approximately 9.4, a rise in female schooling of 0.94 years, and a rise in the share of births attended by trained personnel of about 13.3%. I then asked what proportion of countries that started out in 1995 with about the average 1990 level of each variable uh, actually achieved over the next 10 years the requisite rise to get the five per thousand infant mortality decline. So the answer was, and this is the right-hand column, <clears throat> of the 12 developing countries that started out in 1985 with a GDP per capita of about $2,000, only three achieved over the next 10 years the requisite rise in GDP per capita of $391. Of 44 developing countries with at least two high quality income distribution surveys between 1950 and 1995, only six have ever achieved over any span of time the requisite uh, uh, decline of 9.4 points. Conversely, three of the eight developing countries that started out in 1985 with about 60% of births attended by trained personnel achieved the requisite 13.3% rise by 1995, and seven of the nine developing countries that started out in 1985 with around 60% of births attended by trained personnel uh, achieved the requisite 13.3% rise by 1995. These results suggest that rapid economic growth and plunging income inequality are desirable development outcomes, but they are not so easily achieved. For many developing countries, it seems to me, the provision of inexpensive basic social services will probably remain for the foreseeable future a more practically, practical way to reduce the risk of infant mortality. So that's it for the quantitative analysis. I'll now move on to uh, the case studies. Uh, I chose the eight cases because each is, or in the case of South Korea and Taiwan, was a middle income uh, developing country. South Korea and Taiwan are now rich. As well as because each of the eight 
has good data, has an extensive secondary literature, has an important role in the vast literature comparing East Asian and Latin American development, and is reasonably familiar to me. Uh, I visited all the Latin American countries as well as uh, South Korea and Thailand, but not Indonesia or Taiwan. So uh, I think our colleague here is uh, ahead of me on the visits front. Uh, but uh, among the ACE case, eight cases, as you can see from this chart, the East Asian ones, and something weird has just cropped up here. Oh, new software is available from Apple. That's, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> so among the eight cases, uh, the East Asian ones clearly experience faster economic growth and lower income inequality. And in fact, it seems safe to say that any society that did as well as South Korea and Taiwan at achieving economic growth and uh, an even distribution of income would have a huge advantage in achieving rapid infant mortality decline. And also any society that did as poorly as Argentina or Brazil at economic growth and income distribution would have a major handicap at achieving rapid mortality decline. Uh, still, handicaps can be overcome and advantages can be muffed depending on the effectiveness of the public provision of basic social services to the poor. So as you can see from this side, uh, Chile and Costa Rica, which are in green, had relatively slow economic growth and relatively high income inequality. But take my word for it, they did extremely well at providing basic social services to the poor and achieved rapid declines of infant mortality from 1960 to 2010. I actually uh, updated the figures for this talk because the book only goes up to 2005. It was published in 2010. Uh, Indonesia and Thailand achieved rapid economic growth with fairly low income inequality, but did less well at providing basic social services to the poor and registered a relatively slower decline of infant mortality. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to move on now to the main political science question, which is, to what extent is democracy an important cause of government decisions to implement uh, effective primary health care campaigns? Uh, and to the extent that it is an important cause, how exactly might it exert its effects on public policy. The literature on the determinants of social insurance policies is enormous, but the literature on the determinants of primary health care policies is minuscule. My technique was simply to induce from my eight cases four categories of factors that seemed to me to have contributed significantly to nationwide primary health care campaigns. I focused on democracy with special attention to the causal mechanisms by which democratic institutions might work their effects on the provision and utilization of mortality reducing social services. These causal mechanisms, I found, operated more complexly and more ambivalently than is implied by the hypothesis that elected leaders have more incentives than unelected leaders to provide social services that lead to the rapid decline of infant mortality. For one thing, to the extent that democracy does contribute to pro-poor public health care policies, it does so not only through electoral incentives, but also through freedom of information freedom to organize, and in countries with long democratic histories, the development of a sense of equality and entitlement throughout the entire population, not just among the better off. Second, democracy can have negative as well as positive effects on pro-poor health policies. Electoral incentives can, in fact, encourage policies that 
raise the risk of early death. Majorities often prefer income generation to social service provision or curative to preventive health care, even though the latter policies in each case are often more conducive to mortality decline. Likewise, the freedom to organize can empower groups with vested interests in regressive forms of social service provision. This has actually been the case with doctors, medical business, and even labor union leaders in Argentina and Brazil. On to the conclusions. My main finding as far as the wealthier is healthier conjecture uh, was that good primary health care policies can overcome bad economic performance. During the 1970s, and here I'm just talking about that particular decade, Argentina, Chile, and Costa Rica used inexpensive primary health care policies to achieve rapid mortality decline despite slow economic growth, high and rising income po poverty, uh, high and rising income inequality, and also persistent income poverty. Indonesia and Thailand, by contrast, introduced important primary health care programs only toward the end of the 1970s, and then at that time they did so uh, rather ineffectively. Accordingly, they managed during the decade, 1970s, uh, to reduce infant mortality only at a relatively slow pace, especially considering their rapid economic growth, low income inequality, and plummeting income poverty during that decade of the 1970s. My main finding in regard to the proposition that democracy promotes mortality reducing social services is that it generally does and that the means by which it does go well beyond electoral incentives. Freedom to organize, for example, allows interest groups and issue networks more access to policymakers. It bears repeating, however, as another Wesleyan professor, E. E. Schatzschneider, once wrote, that the flaw in the pluralist heaven is that the heavenly chorus sings with a strong upper class accent. More interest group access to policymakers does not necessarily mean more mortality reducing services. Indeed, even when the heavenly chorus sings with a strong labor accent, the result is not always good for the poor. In Argentina and Brazil, powerful labor unions have actually lobbied against attempts by government policymakers to extend health services previously limited to the middle classes and the organized working class to the rural and urban poor. Democracy, I think it should be recognized, probably is incapable of providing all of the instrumental benefits sometimes expected of it. Even if democracy provided no instrumental benefits whatsoever, it should be said, it could still be justified, as Amartya Sen has argued, on intrinsic grounds, insofar as to participate politically enhances the lives we have reason to value, and on constructive grounds, insofar as democracy is conducive to the formation and modification of preferences, as well as potentially to the satisfaction of the preferences that we already have. Moreover, as Amartya Sen has also pointed out, democracy does not affect healthcare spending, health service provision, or health status, like quinine works on malaria. Democracy only creates in opportunities. Citizens and political leaders still have to take advantage of them. It is, I think, up to us and our politicians to seize the opportunities that democracy provides and make them work for rather than against the expansion of human capabilities, especially for the least advantaged members of our societies. <laughs>
Thank you. So because we are recording questions uh, and answers, uh, recording this, this event, uh, we'd like people who have questions to uh, ask the questions on the uh, microphone. So Professor Webster. Great, Jim, thank you for a really uh, interesting and rich talk. Oh, um, I'm wondering if you could dig down a little bit into the democracy index you use, because um, I work mostly on East Asia, so those are the countries I'm most familiar with. But um, in Taiwan, for example, you don't have democracy until 1987. In arguably even a decade after that with the fall of martial law. Mm -hmm. South Korea can be dated to 1989, the, the repeal of martial law. Um, Indonesia, 1998. Thailand, even now, you yeah. know, there's a constitutional coup as there have been 18 in the past 70 or 80 years. Um, so how do you actually measure when democracy begins in each of those countries? Um, or is that, and does that, would that sort of change the importance of democracy in the findings you ultimately show? Thank well, you. thanks for the question. Uh, the, the, the Polity 4 index uh, is an 11 point scale ranging from 0 to 10. And um, <clears throat> so it's not a 0 1 variable, you know, so it doesn't really tell you when democracy starts, so to speak. Uh, there have been some efforts to dichotomize it. I think 7 plus gets coded as a 1 and 6 minus a, as a 0. But how good is this as an index of what I would call democracy? It's uh, junk. Uh, it's not exactly junk, but it's, um, it's the best that we have, but it's really pretty bad. And it's, it is sensitive to things like coups, and you know, you'll find that uh, having elections uh, come you know, martial law still being in effect, you're going to get a lower score than having elections after the martial law uh, has been removed. So you get a little play in it, but it, it's really an index of elec electoral contestation. It doesn't tell you much at all about either basic human and civil rights or whether the people who get elected in those contested elections actually have any real power. So I'm uh, very dubious about the index, and I wrote about that in the, in the book on page 30 something, or I can't remember, but uh, there is an interesting initiative going on at, uh, <clears throat> I guess based mostly at the University of Notre Dame, which your, your colleague Kelly McMahon is involved in, uh, to create something called VDEM, which is an infinitely more sophisticated index, and it would be fantastic to like, try this analysis again with a better indicator of democracy. Sure. I'd just like to follow up on that. Uh, so my sense is, though, that roughly, if you were to look at the scales, um, would you say, looking at the, at, at the scores for each country over time, that, that roughly tracks changes in how democratic it is and so on? So Chile yeah. probably gets a lot less democratic around 1973, for example. Right. That's, that's exactly the case, although Chile is not particularly... Like, um, <clears throat> here's an example of how crappy the index is. Uh, the United States received in 2010 in the Polity 4 index a democracy score of 10, the maximum. Big surprise. Well, you know, arguably there are a few problems with democracy in this country. For example, um, in places like Ohio, openly partisan officials supervise the elections and count the votes. Uh, legislation presses the limits of voter suppression in a number of states. Um, Ex-felons are not allowed to vote in, uh, in many states, uh, disenfranchising something like four or five million people. I mean, we do have a few problems. Uh, you could forgive the Polity Index maybe for overlooking that, but the United States also got a democracy score of 10 in 1848. And I wasn't alive then, but my understanding is that slavery existed, women lacked the right to vote, and uh, Native Americans were not allowed to acquire citizenship, and there were a few other problems in the polity at that point. So, you know, it really isn't very good, but uh, except for, you know, <laughs> the rich countries, I think South Korea, uh, sorry, South Africa under apartheid actually got a higher democracy score than Argentina under Carlos Menem. He isn't my favorite politician, but 
Uh, I don't think things were as bad from the democracy standpoint as under apartheid in South Africa. So unfortunately, we have to work with the democracy in indices that we have uh, rather than the ones that we wish we had. Before I pass this on, I'm just waiting for somebody else to raise their hand, uh, I would like to uh, just follow up on one other thing, if you could, because it seems to me that uh, one of the long-term cases uh, are, in some sense, Chile and Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say a little, word, little about, about your findings about long-term democracy and, the, and, and, and its effects in, uh, in, in your case studies? Uh. Yeah, um, in fact, um, I would be happy to take Chile as an example because uh, that's quite an interesting case, but uh, I don't know if you probably won't recall, but um, one of the findings there was that uh, with infant mortality, uh, actually short-term democratic practice had no significant association with the infant mortality rate, but long-term democratic experience had a strong association in the expected direction. And uh, Chile is a good example. Um, under General Augusto Pinochet uh, from 1973 to 1990, the infant mortality rate in Chile fell from 65 to 19 per thousand, which in percentage terms is one of the fastest drops in human history anywhere on the planet. And uh, you know, you might inquire as to like, why exactly did this evil dictator uh, do enact policies? Because it's, it's well known, it can easily be shown that uh, he wasn't fudging the statistics or anything. The infant mortality really did fall and there's an obvious reason for it. He enacted some extremely good programs aimed at extremely impoverished uh, women and children. I guess the assumption is that their husbands might be communists and should be tortured and murdered, but uh, women and children are just, you know, helpless and, you know, need to be taken care of by a paternalistic state. And Mussolini actually did the same thing in Italy in the 1930s. Um, so what exactly was it that induced Pinochet to enact these policies? I think it had to do with Chile's long history of democratic experience and the fact that he knew if he didn't do something nice for the poor, at least for the women and children uh, sector who didn't do much demonstrating or were not particularly obstreperous, uh, that you know, he was going to pay for it uh, in the long run. Of course, there are some other possible reasons um, that maybe somebody could write a senior thesis on Sunday, like, uh, you know, if you wake up in the morning every day and say, hmm, everybody in the world thinks I'm an evil dictator. Uh, what can I do about this that would be extremely cheap? Oh, I know, I'll get the infant mortality rate down really fast. So that could have been a factor too. But I think Chile's a, a case where you see the effects of long-term democratic experience having an effect even under a harsh authoritarian regime. Yeah, I appreciate your talk a lot. Um, the thing I took out most importantly is these small interventions that seem to help. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what are some of these interventions they used? <clears throat> Were they uh, a tr you know, used in other countries that weren't successfully implemented, and why not? Why did it work in some countries and potentially in other countries? <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a great question that uh, would re Require optimally a kind of a longish answer, but the ones I measured were um, child immunization for diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus uh, on the one hand, and for measles on the other, and the other was the proportion of births attended by trained personnel. So those are the ones I was able to measure quantitatively. Of course, there's a lot of others, but there's things like you know prenatal visits, uh, well baby visits. Um, I guess prenatal care I did measure uh, post, postpartum care. Uh, also interventions having to do with uh, provision of nutritional substance, supplements, micronutrients, powdered milk. These are the types of, of things that I'm talking about. And you know, they have been uh, uh, implemented everywhere. And as I mentioned, Thailand and Indonesia, as I'm sure you know, 
implemented in, I guess it was 1978 in Thailand, and I forgot the initiation date in Indonesia, somewhere around that, um, you know, policies that uh, were providing these uh, services as well, but uh, those governments were not as good as the governments in, say, Chile and Costa Rica at doing things like checking up on the health clinics and making sure that the nurse was actually there. And, uh, you know, they just didn't have the sort of state capacity that Chile, I mean, they do now, well, Thailand does now. Thailand is, uh, you know, kind of a success story over the last 20 years or so in public health. But uh, Indonesia is a big place, and, you know, that's, a, that's another issue. Indonesia and Brazil are handicapped by the fact that a lot of people, a lot of poor people in those countries live in very remote areas where it's very expensive and difficult to check and see whether the nurse is still in the, the, the health station. So those are the kind of, um, you know, I guess you would call them proximate determinants that I would like to be able to measure but uh, was not able to for this particular study. So I guess my question is along the same lines. If I'm a leader of a country like Bolivia, how would you advise me in terms of if I wanted to uh, lower the infant mortality? Um, actually, Bolivia, I think, has had some success in recent years, and I would basically say um, look at the policies that were successful in Costa Rica and Chile, and, you know, in other countries like uh, Cuba, the Indian state of Kerala, uh, you know, there's some, Sri Lanka is another one. There, there's some well-known success stories. You know, you should probably try to emulate the types of policies that were enacted uh, in those countries. Of course, you know, whether that is feasible depends on the context. And in fact, whether the Morales government would be motivated to do that doesn't have much to do with the policies that Jim McGuire thinks would be really good for him to uh, implement. But somehow he seems to have arrived at a fairly similar set of interventions uh, under his own initiative. There's a question up in the front. Did you look at, in, in the various countries to evaluate their family planning programs and their health, uh, health programs? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, uh, the question is whether I looked at family planning as a possible determinant of uh, better sort of health status for, for infants. And uh, yes, I think that's very important. Um, I showed statistically that the fertility rate has a huge statistical association with the infant mortality rate. The higher the fertility rate, the lower the infant mortality rate. The higher the fertility rate, the higher the infant mortality rate. And you know, you can, you can sort of see why that would be the case. Uh, you know, it's uh, having lots and lots of babies all the time. It's harder for, you know, parents to pay attention to all their kids. It's harder for the state to, you know, provide services for all those kids. Uh, also, a high fertility rate has sort of biological uh, effects that are not good for infant mortality. You know, you tend to have more births to very young and very old women, which are relatively high risk. So. I think family planning is a, is a big part of that, and uh, I didn't really show it in this particular analysis, but I, I cover it pretty heavily in the book. I think it's very important. Thank you so, thank you so much for being with us, okay. Professor McGuire. Did you take into account suicides the suicide rate in any of these six countries, meaning both the four, eight, four in East uh, Asia mm -hmm. and four in Latin America, any look at the suicide, number of suicides in those eight nations? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm quite interested in, in suicide. Of course, the suicide rate among people in the first 365 days of life is quite low. Um, you know, it, uh, that's infant mortality is the proportion, or it's the number of infant deaths per hundred, per, per thousand live births. So, you know, suicide really isn't a, a factor there. But if you looked at 
sort of life expectancy or adult mortality, you know, it would, um, it would intervene. I, I think, are there more suicides than murders every year in the United States? I, I think so, aren't there? Uh, Possibly, although these days the big statistic that people cite is heroin overdoses oh. as opposed to auto accidents. Huh. Well, actually, I, I lived up in the, the James Bay in northern Quebec once and, uh, on a, uh, in a Cree community, and a, a lot of what was recorded as auto accidents were actually suicides, single car accidents. And, you know, so there's a lot of play in the statistics. I, I'm pretty sure I read recently that the, in the United States there's more gun-related suicides than gun-related murders, but I don't know about total suicides. Also, the, the suicide rate is much higher among males than females. Females attempt suicide about four times as often as, as males, but males achieve suicide about four times as often as females. Uh, the reason has to do with method. Men often use guns. That's a very effective way. Uh, females are more prone to use pills and uh, other things like that, which can, you know, they can be uh, rescued from. Also, you know, older people, people over the age of 65 have higher suicide rates than, than younger people. So you have to control for a bunch of stuff. And suicide is, is really interesting uh, cross-nationally, but I didn't really cover it in my study. I'd like to follow up on a, on, on a variable that shows, shows up in some first world studies. Uh, Catholicism mm -hmm. and the role of the Catholic Church which one can imagine having uh, all sorts of sort of differential effects. You know, on the one hand, desire to save the infant. On the other hand, you know, restrictions on uh, family planning and so on. Right, right. Uh, one can imagine it being a factor for Pinochet. Uh, so did you pick up in your, in your case studies, it wouldn't be any statistical work, I suspect, uh, anything about the role of Catholicism? Actually, I, I said I tested for dominant religion, but that isn't quite true because I only tested whether the country had a population that was more than 90% Muslim. And that in previous studies, notably that of uh, Dion Filmer and Lant Pritchett in 1999, that had a whacking huge effect in the expected direction of it being associated with higher infant mortality, even when you control for a bunch of other stuff. I didn't look at the Catholic uh, you know, proportion Catholic in particular, and as you just pointed out, um, and as uh, you might hear at Mass on Sunday, in my father's house there are many rooms. And, uh, you know, uh, there, a lot of these uh, dominant religion and so on could have contradictory uh, effects. And you pointed out in the Pinochet case, I think that might be an area in which, um, you know, the his sort of deep Catholic faith might have, you know, been conducive to him in acting policies that had those, those good effects. One thing I did find as regards Catholicism that I found interesting is that um, Chile and Costa Rica, and I think Mexico as well, although that wasn't in my study, uh, both implemented extremely effective family planning programs uh, in the 1960s and it was not opposed at all by the, the Catholic Church. And uh, I read, I was interested in this, and I read a little bit about it, and it appears to be the case that uh, what the people in the Catholic Church, the, the clergy, were worried about was the high abortion rate you were going to have uh, and the high maternal mortality rate that you were going to have if you didn't have family planning programs. So that sort of offset what you might initially suppose would be a sort of a resistance to that. Susan. I was wondering if either in your statistical or your case study analyses, um, if you were able to evaluate or considered evaluating the, the inclusion of the poor demographic in politics versus just uh, democracy in general, but the segment of those involved in policy making in mm -hmm. the democratic process what demographic they belong to because it seems like you might um, it might be interesting obviously because those if you have people in power from the the poor demographic i feel like their prioritization of 
healthcare spending or concern for that just because of their knowledge and personal uh, personal priorities would be would be higher I, I did think about that I was not able to include it because there aren't disaggregated data you know for example on uh, I don't know what you'd say, like maybe voter turnout rates among the poorest 25% of the population versus the highest 25%. I have a friend at the Kennedy School at Harvard named Candelaria Garay. She's from Argentina. She's just written a terrific book manuscript uh, that uh, she does start to get at that in some ways. She does not so much quantitative analysis, sort of case study analyses, but she compares uh, Argentina, uh, what is it? Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, and basically says that in. Um, she finds that in the 1990s uh, up through 2010, which is a much more recent period than I really studied. For example, my quantitative analysis was all about 1990, which is just the start of her period. She f she's found that Argentina and Brazil have actually implemented a. Um, uh, a lot more pro-poor policies than have uh, Mexico and Chile. And she looks at two independent variables to explain this. One is the level of social mobilization of the poor, and the other is the level of uh, <clears throat> the extent to which political parties compete specifically for the votes of what she calls outsiders, which, by which she means the very poor. And she finds that uh, in Brazil, you have um, a lot of political competition for the votes of the very poor between, for example, the PT and the PSDB. In Argentina, there's almost no competition for this because the poor are monopolized by Peronism. Just like in the United States, they're monopolized by the Democratic Party. You know, if we in this country had the Democrats and the Republicans actually competing for the votes of the very poor, I bet we'd have a lot better uh, public health policies. But because they don't compete, because the Democrats have a monopoly, uh, we get basically very, very little. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, and you also have to take into account social mobilization by the very poor, because democracy is not just about uh, elections. that rang particularly true, at least in my experience, mm -hmm. is, is the fragmentation of societies. Mm -hmm. And I think you alluded to that earlier. Uh, have you looked at that as sort of a parameter in trying to look at success? For example, one way of measuring that would be how many different languages are used actively oh. in, a, in a society. Yes, I, I did look at that. There are a number of measures of something called ethno-linguistic fractionalization, at least at started out being ethno-linguistic fractionalization. There you get, you know, countries like uh, Brazil and Cuba being like entirely ethnically, ethno-linguistically homogeneous. Okay, well everybody speaks Spanish and they think about race in a different way than North Americans think about race, but uh, I mean, give me a break, that's 100% in Brazil, uh, that's not a very good measure. Recently, there have been some better measures than, uh, and I used, a, I tested, uh, I think I used the old one, the ethno-linguistic one, but I think I tested it for robustness to a, uh, one of the newer indices, and in both cases, it turned out to be a significant predictor in the expected direction. Uh, the more ethno-linguistic fractionalization, uh, at least the, the, the higher the infant mortality rate, and I think also, the lower the proportion of births attended by trained personnel, although I can't remember exactly. And you can imagine why that would be the case. In countries that uh, have a variety of ethnic groups, there's often discrimination against some of those ethnic groups. Um, in some of those uh, ethnic groups, the people might be reluctant to go and get public health care uh, from, you know, people of the dominant ethnic group. It's kind of like, I think, the main reason why Islam, having more than 90% of the population being Islamic, 
is associated with higher infant mortality it has to do with prohibitions on sort of male doctors treating female patients, although I think that's probably alleviated a little bit with infants, uh, and on female doctors or nurses, you know, treating male patients, and also, you know, people being modest and reluctant to get health services. But it's, a, it's an important factor. There's a lot of work on it, and it's a, my finding is no different than that of a lot of other literature. I was wondering if Professor King would like to say a little about his experience with this variable. <laughs> I think, I, think um, I work a lot in Oceania, oh. particularly in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And, um, and of course, Papua New Guinea is uh, tremendously, I think has about 15, 20% of the world's languages and because of that tremendous, actually it's the Melanesian cultures that extend that are very, very isolated linguistically and they have about 30% of all the languages only, maybe but less than 1% of the world's population. Amazing. And, but it's interesting, if you go to Polynesia, they all tend to be uniform, very different. And the infant mortality and thing is lower in the Polynesian countries than the Melanesian countries, wow. as I recall. And we were talking about very small numbers of individuals. But that's been real um, experience there. And, uh, and part of it is lack of the empowerment, as you're talking about, mm -hmm. because I've been trying to organize at the grassroot levels to demand immunizations, to demand government treatments, demand stuff for maternal and child health, and they're just not there. Uh -huh. Although it's a, Papua New Guinea is a wealthy country now, there's a lot of money coming in, so some of these comments are true huh. in doing this, but it's uh, yeah. interesting. That's fascinating. I'd just like to add on that, that's, there's probably another dimension, which is simply the ability to communicate with the medical personnel, right? Uh, which shows up in the United States in various ways. And yeah. clear, clear, I mean, that you, you could trust them totally, and you still can't communicate with them, and, and that's a real problem. But we do have this so-called uh, Latino or Hispanic paradox, where actually health status is higher once you control for economic affluence among people of Latin or people who, you know, Spanish-speaking people than among English-speaking people. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of work on that. One thing to remember is that's first generation. Okay. Is it, it declines over time. Oh, I see. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a good chance that there's a selection bias yeah. in that the people who manage to get across the border and who are healthy enough to go, go, go do all that may well turn out. It's not just Latinos, it's immigrants in general. Yeah. And the longer they're here, ethnically at least, the, the, the more they get like the dominant population. I see. But I think there's probably a sub substantial selection bias with immigrants being healthier, more aggressive, more, you know, more, more able in many ways. That makes sense. My question is a kind of speculative one. Uh, you zeroed in on infant mortality. Right. Uh, but uh, is there a parallel pattern in other aspects of healthcare? That, that governments or countries that do well in bringing infant mortality down also are interested in widening the services, the medical services that are available to the entire population? Um, hmm. I guess I'm not 100% I'm not sure what you're asking, but you mean to other age groups or, or Okay, there, the other possibility is that, you know, are they also good at, you know, sponsoring, uh, you know, cervical cancer screening or something like that? Uh, and um, my impression is, yes, uh, absolutely. You know, if you go to a rural Thailand and build a health clinic, you're not going to limit it to mothers and infants. You know, in fact, Thailand's a good case in point because when I went there, I went up to uh, Chiang Mai and ran into a doctor there who was actually born in Brooklyn, uh, but got married to a Thai woman, and he actually led a primary healthcare program in the late 1970s, focused on the uh, the Karen and some other ethnic groups on the Burmese border, and he drove me all around and he goes, you know, see that see that uh, building off in the distance. That's a public hospital. It was built in the late 1970s because there was an active communist insurgency here, and it was built to treat battle wounds. But after the insurgency was defeated in the early 1980s, they, uh, you know, they took those hospitals and used them uh, to deliver basic health services to ordinary people. So I think there's a lot of 
synergies there that you could see would lead to uh, you know the same sorts of policies you know being effective on a number of different demographic groups. Yeah, that's been my experience. Huh. Yeah. If I could follow up a bit on that though, so that's been Professor King's experience also. But I just wonder because if you were talking about the WHO. WHO would make a big point about how you should do preventive care and primary care and children, but not do hospitals and stuff like that. So there, there are there are resource trade-offs, and and if you follow the WHO advice, uh, there might be an association between do, doing more of this kind of thing that Jim is talking about to reduce infant mortality and less of some other medical care because the WHO feels that's inefficient and favors the rich. Mm -hmm. the hospital care. So I don't know how it actually yeah. plays out in practice because there's a very complicated politics there. Joe, you're projecting really well, but I think your mic got flipped off. <laughs> it's on now? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, any further questions or comments? Well, I would like to thank uh, Professor McGuire very much for coming here and sharing his research. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming.